Amen. You can be seated. All right, we're going to be uh, in Psalms chapter number one this morning. It is good to be here. And um, a lot of us, well, I think there was about 16 of us. We took a trip to Kentucky uh, this week. We went down uh, to the Creation Museum and then also the Ark and uh, had a very good time and good time of fellowship. A lot of, uh, you know, Christian ethic and Christian um, apologetic or defense of the Christian faith is on display and it was just a good time uh, in the Lord. I encourage you if you get a chance to go down there, you're passing through that area, uh, stop by and visit it. You'll need a little bit of time uh, and uh, it's like someone said trying to drink uh, water out of a fire hose. A lot of information down there uh, but very, very beneficial and uh, really with stuff like that does it really primes the pump. It gets you to ask certain questions and highlights different aspects of your faith. Uh, and uh, one of the things about defending the faith, you have to understand this with uh, creation apologetics or defense of creation. You know creation was a miracle? Amen. Did you know that you cannot prove creation in a scientific lab because it was a miracle? and you can't reproduce a miracle. Uh, so one of the things that you realize, I remember uh, a young man, Eric Saviston, good friend of mine, and um, was in our church and helicopter pilot, and really what reached him as a backslidden, law, well, uns he is backslidden, he wasn't unsaved, but he's backslidden, he's over in Afghanistan, and he found a copy of Kent Hovind's creation CDs. How many ever seen Kent Hovind's creation CDs? Well, he watched those, and it really just set him on fire. It was a turning point in his life uh, where, you know, he had a lot of doubts uh, about the faith. And remember that uh, the devil is uh, a person who questions your faith and tries to get you to doubt what you believe and uh, really to see that there is a defense of the faith and a good, strong defense of the faith. What that does is it strengthens your own uh, belief in the Word of God and belief in the uh, eternal aspects of God, belief in the creation. I remember him uh, wholeheartedly giving himself to apologetics. I said, one of the things that you've got to realize is that... Um, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, do you know that in the days of Noah, if you look at the genealogies, uh, most of those guys and gals knew Adam. So if you wanted to hear about creation, well, ask Adam. He's right over there. I mean, he was in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and yet it did not edify their behavior uh, unless their heart was right with God, and then it did. Uh, and so that's uh, you know important thing to, to know is that uh, a lot of times a, a defense of the Christian faith is really what it's going to do. It's going to strengthen your own personal walk with the Lord. And uh, a lot of different thoughts this week about different texts to take for Sunday. Uh, this is the one that I settled on. It's about the blessed man. Uh, this is a doorway or the entryway into the Psalms. They say for every sigh in life there is a psalm. And uh, for every hilltop or time of rejoicing in life there is a psalm. And what we have recorded in the book of Psalms is the heart cry of the saints. A lot of times you're stuck in your prayer life. Uh, and uh, maybe that's just me. I'm sure that's not you. Uh, but one of the most refreshing places that you can turn to is the book of Psalms because it is all about mankind's vertical relationship with God. When you have that vertical relationship with God correct, all the horizontal relationships fall into place. You're stuck in your prayer life. Turn to the book of Psalms because there's other saints that have been in your predicament, have been in your circumstance and situation, and have articulated their circumstance and their situation to the Lord, cried out to the Lord, uh, and the Lord mightily delivered them. And so Psalms chapter number one is the doorway into the saints' hymn book. It's the doorway into the saints' prayer book. Uh, many would argue, too, that it is the doorway, it is the entryway, also into the Word of God itself. If you understand Psalms chapter number one, uh, you will understand uh, mankind, and you'll understand mankind's relationship with God, and you'll also understand the role 
that the Word of God plays in your life. Uh, so if you found your place there in Psalms chapter number one, let's uh, stand together this morning for the reading of God's Word. Good to see you, Scotty. I've been thinking about, I'm thinking about you this morning. Like, yeah. man, where's Scotty at? I've got to give him a call this week. Well, now I don't have to call him. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. Thank you for Victoria filling in this morning on the piano. I know we've got a lot of people out of town on vacation. I missed the brass section this morning. And uh, they minister you, to you personally if you're sitting on the, you know, the, about the first and second row right here. Uh, it helps me sing, too, when I've got a trumpet covering up my voice. I don't have to hear the sound of my own voice. So we missed them. A lot of people on vacation. And uh, it's good if everybody takes vacation at the same time. We will be low on Sunday and... Then Everybody will come back the next Sunday. Psalms chapter number 1, verse number 1. says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And uh, let's go to the Lord and ask His blessing upon the Word this morning. Pray with me as I lead us in prayer, uh, and let's seek God for a blessing. So let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you just for the day that you've given to us. And Lord, we thank you for this summer season, all we've been able to enjoy, and traveling here and there, and enjoying sunshine, and warm weather, and relaxation, and and, uh, and Lord, we thank you just for those things. We thank you for uh, the chance to be in your house this morning. We thank you for uh, the Holy Spirit, our guide and our teacher. We thank you for the eternal word of God, which we hold in our hand. Uh, Lord, we thank you that uh, you change not. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we, Lord, we thank you that we can see you. We have an opportunity to see you through your word this morning. Lord, I pray that your word would have its work and would have its will and its way in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would help us just to understand Psalms chapter number one. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand it, comprehend it, and then also hide it in our heart. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have further understanding of you and your ways and your interaction with us, your saints, this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd watch over each and every one. I pray for each and every person here under the sound of my voice. Lord, I pray that you would have a blessing from your word for them this morning. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would just have a free course uh, here among us. Lord, may we not hinder you in any way. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Psalms chapter number one is about the blessed man. The blessed man. If you know about the blessed, we a lot of times we think about the Sermon on the Mount uh, and the Beatitudes. And uh, this blessedness has to do with uh, a beatitude. Blessed in thinking, blessed in understanding. And we see here that there's two different peoples found here in Psalms chapter number one. And uh, just like many other places in the Bible, there's only two paths to go. You can be on the straight and narrow path. Uh, you can enter into the straight gate or you can be on the broad way. And here is a blessed man and his blessedness has to do with, yes, his attitude, but it also has to do with divine or heavenly happiness. A lot of times we hear this preached, and it's somewhat true. Okay, we say, 
God never guarantees you happiness, but he does promise you joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. We say this is a supernatural joy that passes understanding. That means you cannot explain it to another person. You can tell them the source of the joy, and the source of the joy is the Lord, but it is supernaturally given to you uh, by the Holy Spirit. We say happiness comes and goes. Happiness is like a thermometer. You know, the mercury in the thermometer, it just goes up and it goes down depending on the circumstances which surround it. Uh, but joy is like the thermometer you know, when you set your affections on things above, you can set your affection on the Lord and he will fill you with joy. You could be like Paul and Silas locked up in stocks and in bonds, having your back whipped and you can sing praises unto the Lord all night long and just rejoice in the Lord. Uh, and this is the joy of the Lord. Uh, but happiness is something that is absolutely circumstantial. Uh, now, in the Bible, there is circumstantial happiness, but then there also is the happiness that comes from above, that you and I can make ourselves happy in the Lord. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. Um, you're in church this morning. Uh, so if I were to give you a quiz and say, where is the source of wisdom and where is the source of understanding? How many want to guess? God, the Bible, Word of God. I mean, you open up the Word of God, you can seek His wisdom, you can seek His uh, understanding, and then what is uh, going to happen? It says you are going to be what? Happy. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. Uh, and so in life, yes, there are circumstances. There are going to be times of celebrating. Uh, there's going to be times of sorrow in this life and even inside the context of a local New Testament church. And that's why the Bible says rejoice with them that rejoice. And then weep with them that weep. Uh, you know, you think of our Lord, um, that our Lord was, we sing, man of sorrows, what a name. You know, man of sorrows, that he was full of sorrow, he's acquainted with grief. Uh, it says he learned by the things that he, was, that he suffered, uh, that he delivered his soul by strong crying and tears unto God. Uh, and so I, I wonder how in the world can you have happiness in the midst of sorrow and happiness in the midst of suffering and happy in the midst of turmoil? Turn, if you will, to Psalm 16 and look at verse number 11. Psalm 16 and verse number 11. Psalm 16, verse number 11, it says there, Thou wilt show me the path of life. There is a way. There's a blessed man. He's going to be on a way. He's going to be on a direction. Uh, it says, The Lord knoweth the way of the godly, but the way of the ungodly, the way of the wicked, is not so. Their feet shall slide in due time. Uh, and so notice this, again, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of, what's the next word? Joy. And at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You know, the Christian life is a mystery to those who do not have Christ. And you know, a Christian can truly experience all the joys and all the sorrows in life and can be undergirded by supernatural happiness and supernatural joy. Now, again, in this life, we're on the way home, and uh, Timmy has really been paying attention to Corvettes and then, secondly, Mustangs. And so the whole way home, he's counting how many Corvettes he's adding up, how many Corvettes he had. <laughs> Julie and I ran a little errand yesterday, and now I'm noticing Corvettes everywhere. No, I'm not going to buy one. Uh, but I know what would happen if I, if I bought one. I went down there and signed on the dotted line. Uh, I know that getting in that thing, there'd be the new car smell, and it'd be glossy and shiny, and I'd, I'd feel the horsepower just behind me and the torque of the engine. I'd have the fastest car on the road. I'd be able to past people uh, at whim and at will, and I'm sure that on a level, level of earthly happiness that my happiness meter would be off the charts, 
Uh, and then, you know, you know what's going to happen. What goes up must come down. Uh, and so at the end of the month, you know, my first payment comes due. <laughs> And then my happiness goes down a little bit. And then, you know, I go to Walmart uh, and I forget to park way in the back of the parking lot, way away from all other cars. And I park in a normal car parking spot. Uh, and some moron scratches my brand new shiny Corvette. And then my happiness plummets even more. Uh, well, this is true with life, you know. Uh, sometimes marrying someone's like getting a shiny Corvette. You know, on the end of the month, the payment comes due, and then dings and scratches and all this, you know. Uh, and so anything, whether it is a job, whether it is an education, whether it is a relationship or whatever, uh, that uh, earthly happiness meter goes up and down. Uh, but yet Paul uh, is able to say about his own Christian life and his own Christian experience, uh, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, he says, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Uh, now, the Lord Jesus, when he walked here upon this earth, he was filled with the joy of God. His face was always beholding the face of his Father. He was in perfect union and harmony with his heavenly Father. Uh, and, and so in his path is joy and pleasure forevermore. And our Lord was able to be undergirded by this everlasting joy uh, and this eternal happiness that comes from uh, above and doesn't come from things, circumstantial things below. Uh, and yet he was able to weep with those that weep. He's able to go uh, to a funeral of his beloved friend Lazarus and weep over the people uh, in their sorrow and their suffering and their lack of faith. Uh, he was able uh, to st uh, to cry over the city of Jerusalem as he saw people perishing all around him and his heart was able to rend and go out to these people. Uh, uh, but yet he was undergirded by eternal, everlasting happiness. Uh, there's one thing about the Christian life and about the Christian experience uh, that we get to experience that uh, unbelievers do not get to experience is that we get to understand the full spectrum of emotion because we are plugged in to God's emotion himself. Uh, and so I can go ahead and cry and weep and wail over my circumstances in life. Now, you know, I assess my circumstances in life and I say, I got it pretty good. Uh, but you know, the worst thing that ever happened to you is the worst thing that ever happened to you. You ever think about that? And, uh, you know, you hear somebody, man, they are just down in the mouth, the mully grubs. I mean, they're just a bitter, you know, upset, cantankerous, poisonous person. You say, man, what's the deal with you? And they say, you know, growing up, my grandmother didn't put enough chocolate chips in my cookies when she made those for me. Uh, and they are just down in the mouth and very, very upset about it. But such is, is life. And uh, really, you know, you boil down your complaints in your complaint department, uh, you know, you really realize that it all boils down to you didn't get enough chocolate chips uh, in your cookies growing up. All of us have been eternally and forevermore blessed by God himself. And because of this fact, uh, we get to experience life fully and completely and come what may come what might uh, you might be like brother Barry who's got a diagnosis of cancer is fighting cancer right now you could be like the Mickelsons whose house burnt down uh, last week and you know say you know I'm sorrowful but I'm always rejoicing Amen. blessed is the man there I am a blessed man I am a blessed woman uh, because the Lord has eternally blessed me with certain divine things that only come from above. There's a few things about this blessed man here in Scripture that we'll take note of. Uh, first thing about this blessed man is the things that he does not associate with and the things that he is separated from in his life life. Verse number one, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the, uh, or standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The one thing that the blessed man is separated from, he is separated from a walk with the world or the world system. And so we say the majority of people have not chosen to follow God and uh, there by default 
have given over their lives and their hearts and their minds to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit which now worketh in the children of disobedience and what we would call the world system and the world's way of doing things. It says that he walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Ungodliness just has to do with not towards God. Remember uh, seven up? See uncola? Uh, ungodly just simply, I mean, this, this is uh, sweet old grandmothers, uh, it's uh, bartenders, uh, street workers, it's the whole gamut uh, of people. There's one commonality about them is that their life is not directed towards God. They are ungodly and they are walking their own way. Isaiah 53 talks about this when it says, all we like sheep have gone astray each to their own way. You see, when we repent and come to Christ, we turn away from our own way and we turn towards the shepherd. We turn towards God and we start following him. Uh, so he's separated from the world. And uh, here's how he's separated. He doesn't listen to the ungodly. Notice it says, uh, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Um, Psalms 10. Look at Psalms 10 really quick. Psalms 10, verse number 4. It says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all of his thoughts. Talks about this in Romans chapter number one, is that they did not want to retain the knowledge of God in their mind. Therefore, God had turned them over to a reprobate mind. Uh, and so there are certain people that conduct their lives as if God did not exist, as if he did not create them, if, as, if, uh, uh, as if they didn't live and move uh, by his own power as he upholds the creation. It says, in him we live and move and have our being. Uh, and so they live by imagination. You know, you have to imagine in your heart that there is no God. It says, the fool has said, there is no God. In his heart, he has said, there is no God. Every once in a while, I'll meet somebody who tells me they do not believe in God. It's amazing how upset you can be about something you don't believe in. Yeah, I hear you, brother. You know? And I like to say this to them, you know that... Uh, your name is in the Bible. Psalms 14, verse number one. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And I will say that to them uh, because I'd rather be their friend and tell them the truth. And I'll try to tell them to love and I'll laugh as I tell them that. Uh, but I mean, ultimately, uh, the, you have to be a fool and you have to have an evil imagination and imagine something that is not true, that is not real, to live as if there is no God because there is a creator God uh, and there is a savior God who died for your sins and offers you the free gift of salvation and offers up to you the path path of life uh, and offers up to you guidance in the path of life to come to him, offers you the opportunity to seek him and to walk with him and behold his face. Uh, and so there is a large group of people that live as if God does not exist. And so he doesn't listen to them and he doesn't linger with them. Look at this in, in verse number one again. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, so first it has to do with uh, living according to a godless philosophy or a godless culture. So if you turn on the television, you listen to the radio, you listen to secular music, and you talk with your coworkers, and you start adhering uh, the philosophy of life uh, and the way they conduct their life and the pattern of their behavior, it enters into your life. It says you'll start walking with them. And uh, it says in Amos, can two walk together except they be agreed? Anytime the nation of Israel turned away from God, it says Israel has turned unto idols. No longer do they walk with God and have fellowship with him. Now they are turned aside and they are practicing in their life uh, behavior away from God. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, here is God's purpose for your life. God created Adam and Eve. He placed them in the garden for this purpose. 
he created them in his image so that he could have fellowship with you. Uh, and uh, he's not going to have fellowship with Adam and Eve. I can have fellowship with my wife because she's in my image. I can't have fellowship with my three dogs. I know three dogs too many. I admit that. And uh, I can't have fellowship with them. I can't say, hey, how, how was your food today? Uh, how, did you, how did you feel about the uh, weather outside? I see that you're panting, you're hot. Uh, I can't uh, have fellowship with them, but I can with my wife, why she's made in my image. God made you in his image. Uh, he placed men and women in the garden. And then what did he do with them in the, in the uh, cool of the day? Yeah. Walked with them. Uh, and so there's one purpose for your life. That is to walk with God. So it says, blessed is the man that uh, he says here, he doesn't listen to a certain group of people and a certain philosophy of the world. Uh, he says he doesn't walk with a certain uh, people or this certain pathway, and he doesn't sit with them uh, in a certain way. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, um, when the Lord came to earth, there's a certain group of people that wanted to stone the Lord to death. They finally got him crucified for blasphemy because he made himself equal with God. And they were people who they proclaimed to love the law of God. What was that group of people's names? The Pharisees, right? Uh, and so Jesus says, you got it all wrong. He says, search the scriptures. In them ye think ye have eternal life. They are they which do testify of me. You know what the Bible's about? About Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and you know what the Bible's about? Is how to have a relationship with the Son of God himself. You remember when the resurrected Lord uh, walks with his disciples in the way? Mm -hmm. uh, and he's teaching them. He hides from their eyes who he is, and they don't know who he is. They think he's one of the gardeners there because he's there uh, in Joseph of Arimathea's garden. Uh, and he opened up the scriptures and taught them from Moses, Psalms, and then also all the prophets, all the things that the word of God said concerning himself. You know, if Jesus was preaching to you this morning, he would open up the word of God. He would preach the word of God, and then he would point you to himself through the word of God. Any false teacher, uh, and there's plenty of them, there's a plethora of false teachers, just like there was false prophets in the Old Testament. There's false preachers, there's false prognosticators today who would open up the word of God and teach you something something other than having a relationship with God himself. And so here he says, the blessed man, he doesn't sit in the counsel of the ungodly, uh, nor does he stand in the way with sinners. Let me tell you, there's a progression going on here. If I start listening to ungodly philosophy, I start making idols out of people who do not follow after God. I start walking with them. I start living their lifestyle. You know, there's uh, walk with wise men, thou shalt be wise. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. Uh, and a man is known by the company of the friends that he keeps. And so uh, he starts yoking up with the world. And then it says he stands in the way of sinners. Now a stand, to take a stand for something, you know, Paul writes to young Timothy, and we'll be there tonight. Uh, he talks about hold fast the sound of uh, the, the sound words. He says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned from a child. Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise by faith unto salvation. He says, you better get a good grip. He says, you better take a hold of this book and you better hold on to it. Amen. You better be like David's mighty man whose hand clave to the sword. You better hold on to the word of God. You better get a good grip because the world's going to come along, Brother Ernie, and try to see how easy that was? He did not have a good grip of his body. <laughs> try to pull that right out of your hands. Uh, and so here's what happens. You start uh, being enticed by the wisdom of this world 
There's two sources of wisdom too. James talks about there's a wisdom that is from above, uh, that is peaceable, uh, that's full of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Then there is the wisdom that is from below, earthly, sensual, and devilish. Uh, and so I start listening to the world. I start walking with them. Uh, and then I make a stand for ungodly behavior. Uh, it's amazing. I've seen this happen. You know, Christian, man, I know they're Christian. I know they're saved. I mean, I've had Christian fellowship with them. I can't see in their heart. But man, I've experienced good Christian fellowship with them uh, and then all of a sudden they start listening to the world they start walking with the world and then they make a stand for their on on not toward on godly behavior it is amazing i mean they know what the word says but yet they're going to stand and, and make a defense for why they're going to walk a certain way they're making a stand i said to people and i'll say it again come counseling with me and you say you know, I, I have peace about that. And I was like, yeah, you know, Jonah had peace. He was uh, sleeping on his way down yeah. to Joppa, you know. Um, uh, you know, I, I've, had, I've prayed about this. Well, let's open up the Bible and let's look what God says. Uh, and then I'll say something like this. Now, if I got 10 godly people in here who loved God and loved his word, what do you think they would say? Well, they would agree with you. I've had people say this. You know what they're doing? They're making a stand with the wicked. And then, here we go one step further. Once I practice wickedness, I sit in the seat of the scornful. And a scorner actually mocks Christ. The scorners were the ones on the cross where they're sticking out his lip at him. It talks about in Psalms chapter number 24. They, they stick out their lip at me. They mocked me. He saved others himself he cannot save. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. Oh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Oh, he calls for Elias. Well, maybe Elijah will save him. Uh, and so here you see Christians making a stand all of a sudden uh, for wrongs, uh, a wrong behavior. And then finally, Finally, sitting in the seat of the scornful is actually to mock, make a mockery out of what you and I believe and what you and I practice. And you know people who think you're a fool this morning for going to church. Maybe I'm the only one that does. But I know people, yeah, and they sit in the seat of the scornful and actually, and they think that they're attacking you and me, but, <laughs> you know, uh, I just following somebody, following Christ, you know, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a messed up sinner, but Jesus ain't messed up, and he's the son of God. He's worthy of my praise. He's worthy of my adoration. He's worthy of my affection, uh, and so number one, the blessed man is going to be marked by the things which he doesn't do. He avoids this downward trend, listening to the ungodly, standing for sinful practice, and then sitting with those who scorn the godly. And so the blessed man's life is going to start with a negative. And anything good in this life always does. How about the gospel message? You know, the gospel, there's no easy way to paint it. That First, before you can get the good news, you're going to have to understand the bad news, the diagnosis of your life, uh, and that is you are an unworthy, broken, hell-bound sinner worthy of eternal damnation. How's that? Warm the <laughs> cockles of your heart? Now, that's the diagnosis of your spiritual condition without Christ, but here's the good news of the gospel. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God is not willing that any should perish. And I can turn from my sin to Christ and receive the eternal gift of salvation. And so here it starts with a negative. Happy is a man that is marked by the places he doesn't go and by the people he doesn't associate with and the things he doesn't allow his eyes to see and the things he doesn't allow his ears to hear. And then it continues with a positive. And we're about to get to the good part of this psalm. You know, the Christian life, yeah, it's a negative, but it's a big positive. It's a big positive. You know, I've never met one person that has received Christ as their Savior and uh, regretted it. Said, you know, I, I wish I never got saved. 
I wish I never received Christ as my Savior. I mean, that was a big mistake. I have never heard that in my life. Uh, that will show me the path of life. And in thy presence is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. What the blessed man does is he realizes that there is a way of destruction and he turns his self from that destruction and he turns himself towards the Lord. And you see here that, that he has a delight. Notice this, but his delight. We see that he is separated from the world, but he's going to be satisfied with the word. It says in verse number two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. There's an emphasis there, and it's on the Lord. It's the Lord's law. We see God through his word. We experience God through his word, and it says that he delights in it. Delight has to do with this. It says, am I on? What are you doing, John, to my... You can hear it? Okay. I heard something different up here. Oh, there's two Johns back there at the same time. Too many Johns back there. All right. It says, but his delight. Here's delight. Delight is a high degree of pleasure or satisfaction of mind, joy. His delight is in the law of the Lord, that which gives great pleasure, that which affords delight. And that's Noah Webster. He says, here, you want to know what delight is? Noah Webster says, Look at Psalms chapter 1 and verse number 2. He says, delight is this, a high degree of pleasure or satisfaction of mind. Uh, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Let me read you this. This is Hebrews eleven twenty four 24 through 26. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now it says, Moses, when he was coming to years, chose not to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. If you remember the story uh, that the princess of Egypt, and some would say that he would even have been some sort of heir to the throne, that he would have been the next Pharaoh uh, in line. Uh, Josephus tells us he was mighty and you know, it says in Acts 7, he's mighty in word and in deed. Josephus tells us that he led great armies, uh, that he went to the temple of the sun, which would have been the Oxford of the East, uh, that he was, he was at the top of high society in the greatest empire in the world at that time, and he was heir to the throne, uh, and it says this, he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Remember we said at the beginning that the Lord Jesus Christ was a, a, a man of sorrows and he was acquainted with grief, but yet he says he chose, and he, he chose uh, the people of God, and he chose rather to suffer affliction with uh, the people of God, choosing Christ greater riches. Remember he forsook the pleasures of sin for a season. What does it tell us in Psalm 1611? In his presence are pleasures forevermore. So a lot of times that we think, man, Moses made some sort of a selfless decision. I mean, here he is in the lap of luxury, in the lap of power and prestige, uh, and that he was just uh, doing, you know, you know, just doing so great, and then he just took one on the took one for the team, man. He just said, uh, man, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna go and be with these slaves. You know what he did? He made a wise choice. And it was really for himself and for his own soul is that he says, treasures in Egypt or treasures in Christ? And he says, treasures in Christ is greater than everything in Egypt. He says, pleasures of sin for a season or pleasures in Christ. And he says, pleasures in Christ are greater. It's an easy decision for me. I'm going to throw in my lot with Christ. The Apostle Paul did the same thing. Philippians 3, 7 and 8. He says, But the thing which are gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. 
Um, so he tells about us. He tells us, I was a Pharisee, the Pharisee. I was a ruler of the Jews. Uh, I was a member of the Sanhedrin. I was lettered. I had the big ring on my finger to prove it. I wore the, the robe of the Sanhedrin. I even got power from Rome. I could hail whoever I wanted to into prison. I could, even had the power uh, to execute people. I was a man of renown. And I walked into the room. Everything stopped. Uh, people looked up to me. He says, but when I found Christ, he says, I found something so greater that the former things were but as dung. Do I have to expound what dung means? <laughs> he says, a hot, steamy pile. He says, my former <laughs> life was junk compared to my life now. And you remember that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came into your life, he says, I've come to give them life and life more abundantly. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you don't have Jesus and you're not living for Jesus in your life, uh, you know what you have? You are the ultimate loser. You do not even have a life. You know what it says here in Psalms chapter number 1? The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft. They are nothing. In the end, it is absolutely nothing, and they lose everything. But he that has Christ has life, and he has life forever. More. So he says, his delight, the joy of his heart is the Lord, and he seeks the Lord through his law. And so he satisfied with the word of God, he delights in the word of God, and here his attention is given over to the word of God. Look at it, verse number two again. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Meditation has to do with ruminating. Ruminating, we, a good illustration of that is cows. And so, uh, Brother Amster's got a, a bunch of heifers over at his place, a bunch of dairy cows. They do a good job cooking up those, those cows, too. I tell you what, I remember asking Brother Amster one time, I said, uh, you ever think about you know, the, the old girl when you're eating her? And... Uh, he said, yeah, and when I asked him, he says, this particular one I didn't care for. So he had no problem eating her. Uh, so cows ruminate. So what they do is they eat grass, and then they have four stomachs, and it goes to the first stomach, and then they burp it back up into their mouth. And they sit there, and they chew the cut, and they chew it for a while. They ruminate on it, and then it goes back down to stomach number two, comes back up. Sound fun? Don't you wish you could do that with that cake today? I mean, just enjoy it for the rest of the day. Chew on it for a while, and it goes back down, and it comes back up. And so what, what is feeding the blessed man's heart, and what's feeding his soul, uh, and what is the delight of his thinking and his thought life is the Word of God, and he always has some sort of a truth that is currently feeding his soul. And you know people like this, and I know people like this that are godly, that love the, the Word of God, and they always have a certain truth that they're working on, that they're thinking about, that they're meditating in, and something that they are delighting on, that they're fixating in, uh, and, and right in there, in that part of the Word of God, they're going to meditate therein day and night. This is feeding their soul, satisfied by the Word. Number three. The blessed man is situated by the waters. Verse number three, it says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth fruit, bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. This meditation upon the word brings in a, a constant source of life. And notice this, that you're like a, either like a tree or you're like chef. There's only two options. And it says the tree is planted by the rivers of life. Jesus said this in John 7, 38. He that belie believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Uh, we sing this, man, junior church, man, I love the junior church song, and it's fun to lead the kids and sing. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. 
opens prison doors, sets the captive free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up a well in my soul. Spring up a well, splish splash, and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me new life, abundant and free. So the Bible says there that if we are born again by the seed of the word of God, that we are planted. This means that God himself, he might have used a soul winner, he might have used a, multi, uh, a multitude of different people to be a blessing to you, but it was ultimately the word of God that took that seed and planted you by hand. God placed you by hand and he planted you next to a river of life and you have this source of life forevermore. You're planted and notice this, you are also productive. And it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Now, the Lord told us the parable. He says, the parable of the sower. He says, if you understand this parable, you'll understand all parables. And so a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's something in our world that compares how things work uh, in the eternal realm. And so remember, a sower went forth to sow. Sowers out there sowing. Jesus tells us what this, this sower is. The sower is the Son of Man. And it says the seed is the Word of God and the soil is the hearts of man. Some of the seed fell by the wayside. Some of it fell on the stony ground. Some of it fell on the thorny ground. And then some fell on good ground. Uh, and so that some that fell on the wayside, stony ground soil, it says the birds of the air came and immediately picked that up. And that way had a uh, picture there uh, in, in Matthew 13. You can read all about it. Uh, that's a picture of Satan and his demons. Some people's hearts are so hard that Satan will snatch up any word so they can't even think about it. They don't just go on with their life and they never even thought about the word that was sown. Uh, others fell on shallow ground. And it says about this, about shallow ground. These people have no root in themselves. Listen to this. Some people will come to Christianity and they have a superficial change. But there's no root in their heart. There is no heart change. I've known people like this. They come and try out Christianity. They're pretty excited about it. They've got a new group of people to travel with, and they all seem pretty honest, and at least on Sundays. Uh, and, uh, you know, they all seem like a good group of people, and they care for one another. I'm going to try my lot with these Christians. I'm a Christian now. And they even try to change a few things in their life, and, there's, and we say, hey, look, they're growing. But we don't understand. It never went to the heart. They are not saved. And it says, but when persecution comes, it says they wither away and they're gone. Uh, and then you have the thorny ground soil. And that never takes root down in the heart either. You see that the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things choke out the word and so that they are unfruitful. But the good ground soil, you know that a lot of your growth is down before it's up? If someone professes Christ and it seems like forever before they start showing fruit, I don't really mind as long as the root, I, I know that, man, the, the roots are getting in there and the root system is being worked on. It says, he shall bear fruit in his season. Not every season of your life is a fruit bearing season, uh, but there is that root that should be growing down and outward. Amen. Dug a Amen. koi pond. It's like a sore spot right now. We had to work on it all day yesterday. Uh, but uh, man, there is roots that are 30 feet long from one of the big oak trees. Now, I mean, those roots are forever more stretched out there. And that's supposed to be your life and mine as we're ruminating and we're thinking about the Word of God and we're letting uh, the Word of God sink down deep into our heart. You know, I was thinking about, I was thankful for, that my kids got to go with us this week. Um, you know, earlier when they were younger, I don't think they would have got as much out of uh, you know, the Creation Museum and the Ark, and I was thinking about this portion of Scripture, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe give a chance just for those roots to get a little bit deeper in their life and down mm -hmm. solid in their right life. And so it says he's planted by the rivers of water, uh, and he says he's going to be fruitful. And so the good ground soil is going to bring 30, 60, some 100-fold uh, fruit, and it says he shall bring forth fruit in his season. Notice this. Here's a promise to you, Christian. His leaf also shall not wither. And so, you know, you have certain trees in your yard and then the fall time rolls around and they turn color and then the leaves die and they fall off. But you have certain evergreens around there. Did you know that you, believer, 
are an everlasting, evergreen tree and that you will never run out of the source of life. It says in Philippians chapter number one, he that hath begun a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And I want to say this morning that I'm as excited about the Lord Jesus Christ as I was the day that I got saved. And that was an everlasting uh, source of nourishment and strength being planted by the rivers of life. And it says there also that his leaf shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Planted, productive, there's perpetuity, evergreen. Let me say this another thing too. Um, is when you're preaching and teaching inside of the Bible, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what time period of human history you're in. Truth is truth forever. You know why you can open up Charles Spurgeon or Matthew Henry? You know Matthew Henry's been dead for over 500 years and people are still reading from him? You know, because he's talking about some everlasting truth. You know, 10,000 years from now, you're still going to be marveling at the fact that the Lord God changes not, uh, that, uh, that his mercies are new every morning, great is his faithfulness, uh, that these are everlasting things. And then it says there that you will be prosperous. And of course, we let God define what prosperity is. I was listening to... Um, podcast and this guy hey he started he did a startup i can't remember what startup it was anymore but i remember the statement he made and he sold it. he went public and then he became a billionaire and he's in his 20s nice. and he made the statement. he says you know you can't truly be unhappy until you have everything in life that you thought you wanted yeah. oh, wow. Good. Wow. and then the truth Look, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter number 17. Jeremiah chapter number 17. In Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah preaches from Psalms chapter number 1. In Jeremiah 17, 5, It says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. We can say, Walketh in the counsel of the ungodly. So you're either trusting God's counsel or you're trusting in man's counsel. That's your two options. There is no other choice. So you're either listening to God through his word or you're following a godless society. So here it says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and who maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like a heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. You know how you're watching a western movie, and uh, the guys are out there in the middle of the street, and the wind's blowing, dust is blowing around, uh, and then tumbleweeds start rolling through? Sure. Um, you know that tumbleweeds are not native to the Midwest. <laughs> they came in with the European settlers. Uh, it's some sort of a German weed, from what I understand. But yeah, it'd dry up in the desert and it'll start rolling across, being blown about with the winds. You know what that is? A heath in the desert. That's a tumbleweed. And so it says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind bloweth away. Remember, you're either a tree or you're chaff. Yep. Yep. So here he says, They will not see when good cometh. So, so we've got a beautiful young married couple right down here, Jeremiah and Ruthie. We're sending them off. You know, I've known, and you've known, people who have a beautiful family and ruined it. Yeah. And, and, I mean, what, you've got to, you've got to, nice house, you got nice stuff, you got a beautiful home, you got a beautiful family, and yet you're discontented and you can't get any satisfaction. Yeah. Yep. Think about a, a group, I think they're in their 80s or 90s now, they go out and sing, and they say that, I did anything I want any old time, and then they sing, I can't get no satisfaction, yep. though I try and I try. I Sorry you. I put that song in your head this morning. 
Probably wasn't from the Lord, but uh, <laughs> anyway, good illustration. They can't get any satisfaction. It says they can't see good. The little that the righteous man hath, says in Psalms 37, is, gre gre is greater than the riches, it says, of many wicked. Bill Gates, Elon Musk, you name them, all these guys. Uh, the little that you have is better than all of their riches because God gives you power to enjoy uh, your daily bread and your amen, daily sustenance amen, amen. and uh, the people that he has put in your life. And that's why I can't imagine uh, being married and having a family without Jesus in it. Because I know I would self-destruct because I wouldn't get satisfaction uh, that is only meant to be, be my sole satisfaction in the Lord. And so Jeremiah says, he's like a heath in the desert. There's no rest for the wicked. The wicked are like the troubled sea. There is no rest. They run to and fro, and this is their existence on earth, and that's their eternal existence in hell. Verse number seven, it says, but blessed is the man. Notice this. Here's the blessed man. Blessed is the man who trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when the heat cometh. And her leaf shall be green and shall be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. You know, crazy times. Talk a little bit about this tonight. Perilous times. This means unraveling with society. Um, you know, one of the gubernatorial candidates was uh, almost stabbed, <laughs> stabbed to death last week. Uh, two police officers in Rochester, I mean, Rochester needs prayers, were ambushed. And uh, one guy in the force I understood he could, could have retired a long time ago and chose to stay on and serve, uh, is now dead. His family is grieving. Uh, I mean, there, there is a wicked time in which we live. I mean, just wild out there. Uh, and so th there can be a heat wave, a desert of affliction. And it says, guess what, Christian? If you're, if you're planted by the, by the river of life, you won't see the evil. Yeah. That you'll be sheltered. And no matter what comes in your life, you know, who knows what this week's going to bring forth in your life. That's right, brother. Amen. And, and like we said at the beginning, there is, there is suffering in this life. Uh, and there is weeping and there is sorrow. He says, but this man, this woman is undergirded by the happiness and the joy of the Lord that even in the midst of trial and affliction, whether it's uh, financially, whether it's physically, or whether it's with relationships that are around us, it says that they are going to be blind to the heat and their eyes are going to be open to the blessing. Look at verse 9 and number 10 and we'll jump back to Psalms 1. We'll finish. The heart is deceitful above all things. Well, you just got to follow your heart, like, just like Jiminy Cricket said, right? <laughs> it says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? More deceitful than the devil himself uh, is your heart in his, in his mind. And it says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins and give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And the partridge sitteth on the eggs and hatcheth them not so he getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be a what's the next word full so here's what's happening here this partridge that sits on the eggs the eggs aren't hers and so when these eggs hatch they actually run away to the real mother do you know that um the wicked store up treasure for the righteous. That's what the Bible tells us. The meek shall inherit the earth. And uh, here it says, he that seeks wealth without God. I mean, whatever you want to be rich in in this world, if you're not rich in Christ, it says that you're a fool. And I think of two fools in the Bible. Jesus says, uh, there's one person that built their house on the sand. The other person dug down and got down to the foundation and the rock and built their household on the rock. And then when the wind and the waves and the floods come, uh, the house on the rock stood firm where the house on the sand went smash. You learned that in Sunday school. <laughs> and then there's a parable of the rich fool. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger. 
Lord comes to him in the middle of the night. Thou fool. He was a fool and a failure in what he was good at. In prosperity, he was destroyed. Thou fool, thou knowest not that tonight thy soul is required of you. Look back, Psalm chapter number one. We'll finish this up. The wise man sit, situated by the waters. He's planted, productive. There's perpetuity. His leaf will not wither. There's prosperity. Uh, prosperity in this life and then also in the life to come, true God-given prosperity. Uh, and he is prosperous both in time and also in eternity. And then in Psalms 1 there it says in verse number 4, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The winds of life come. The ungodly, remember, they're chaff. They're not trees. John the Baptist said of the ungodly in Matthew 3, 12, it says, when Christ comes, his fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor, the threshing floor, and he will gather wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with fire unquenchable. They will not stand in judgment. At the judgment of eternity, they will fall. Here in Psalms 1, we have two men, two ways, two destinies. The blessed man practices, plants himself, and draws from the, the river of life. Now, rededicate yourself this morning. Say, Lord, I want to be the blessed man. I want to be the blessed woman. I want to be like that tree that is planted. Maybe in some areas of your life. You've been listening, walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Perhaps you're standing in the way of sinners. There's something in your life that you know that God forbids, but yet you're practicing anyway, and you're standing and defending an ungodly practice. Perhaps there's somebody here this morning and you say, Man, in some ways, I've been sitting in the seat of the scornful, sitting there mocking God's people as they're doing their, 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 as they're worshiping God in, in practice and faith. Let's rededicate ourselves to the Lord this morning. Let's say, by the grace of God, I'll be that blessed man. I'll be that blessed woman. I want to be like that tree that is planted, that is firm, that is solid, that is everlasting evergreen. Let's, uh, let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Psalms 1, that blessed psalm. Lord, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would strengthen us, help us to be like that tree planted by the rivers of water. And Lord, we pray that you just bless this time as we speak to you about the things which we have heard. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We'll have a hymn of invitation. As a pianist plays on the piano, however God spoke to your heart, let's speak to him and uh, we'll stand together. The altar's open if you want to pray at the altar. However God spoke to your heart, let's speak to him. Thank you so much for watching the video today. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out more information about our ministry, you can visit us at lbbc.info. Also, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at mylbbc at gmail. We would love to send you a copy of this book right here. It's called Done, What Most Religions Don't Tell You About the Bible. Also, I do a little bit of writing. You can visit my blog at pastorjack.org. God bless you. And if there's any way we can help you, we'd love to be a blessing to you. Have a good day.